Hey everybody, I'm Billy Norton. I'm the Retirement and Financial Education Coordinator for the RCA Board of Benefit Services. Hi everyone, I'm Anna Radcliffe. I'm the Director of Future Church Innovation for the RCA. So this is called Jumpstart, where we're here to help you and your congregation get unstuck wherever you might be feeling stuck. Throughout this video series, we'll offer stories, personal stories, and congregational stories of leaders who have gotten stuck and how they've gotten unstuck. We'll offer you research and data about current opportunities and current ways in which people are getting unstuck, and we have some grant opportunities to offer you. This is Jumpstart. Hi, Billy. Hey, Anna. How are you? Good. Good. So today we're talking about the changing landscape of ministry. Yeah, everything is changing. So much is changing. It's a, it's a hard time. Yeah. Yeah, it requires a lot of innovation, courage, new things. Yeah, yeah. So we thought it would be helpful to just kind of talk about what we mean by church innovation. Mm -hmm. um, in our department, we're kind of talking about this idea of identifying your mission and vision. Who are you? Kind of who has the church always been? And then who is God calling you to be in the future? How, how can you kind of take this whole mission and vision and really start to practice living, living out of that again? It, not that you're not doing that. You know, ministries as they continue on are always kind of working to be the faithful expression of Jesus in the world. But um, sometimes it's really easy to just kind of go through the motions of this is what we've always done. This is how we do this. This is the most faithful way for us to continue. Yeah. Well, th that's what I was going to ask you too. When you say the way the church has always been, do you mean who the church is at her core or just what the church has always done, the way we've always yes. done it. What do you, what do you mean Such when you say that? Such a good question. That? Yeah. So we, we've been talking a lot about for churches, the local church, they're in a particular community, they're in a particular context. And that context is not stagnant. That context is always changing and shifting, which means as ministries to faithfully live into the, the space, we have to kind of treat it like it's this evolving ecosystem. And that ecosystem constantly needs to be tended to or things die. Mm. Um, and so for Church Innovation, the work that we're doing is as we're rediscovering this mission and vision, we're also asking, what might we try? What could we do that might help us um, live into this mission and vision more faithfully? Who are some people maybe that we've not been connected to that we could form these relationships with? Um, and, and it really starts by identifying the external needs, by, by saying both who are our people inside of the church and who are our people outside of the church, and how can we help support and live in and build relationship and connection through those needs. Um, you're starting with the people first, and then you're developing a way of kind of supporting or systematizing or developing programming to, to live into those needs. So the way we've always done things is a really strong pull in yeah. the community. Yeah. So how have you seen churches get to the point even where they're ready for that first step to say, we need to identify you know, who we are and who externally our neighbors are? Yeah. So there's a great story. Um, there was a church that they are quite old and they were really convinced <laughs> that they needed air conditioning. They were like, we haven't had air conditioning. We need it. And um, in, in the kind of rhythm of we've got the money, we're ready to go, let's, let's do this. Let's go all in on air conditioning, which is a lot of money. You know, the pastor said to us, but where are we going? We're ready to go, but where are we going? And, and, and then he thought, well, it's important. We need to pull back and start asking some deeper questions. Where are we going? That is really the, I think, draw for leaders who are trying to do this work differently. Um, it takes a sense of discernment, a willingness to, to say, and to just catch that moment when you're about to go down the lane and to recognize, like, if you don't know the direction that you're heading, that's, that's the moment to press pause. If, if you're kind of acting out of anxiety, you're just kind of moving forward um, without strategy or without really intentionally talking about it with people in your community, that's another impulse to say, if, if you're trying to do it all by yourself, 
that's a, a moment where it's like we need to start asking bigger questions, deeper questions. Yes, and we, we've got to hang on this for a moment because this is this is something, especially in the church's learning change world, yeah. where, where we hang on this because there's a moment where we identify our current reality, right? That's the phrase we're going to use. So we, we start to get really honest about where we are right now without judgment, without shame, and just be honest. Yeah. This, is, this is where we are. And people might have different viewpoints of that, but we start to paint that picture. And then we can see the default reality. Yeah. So if we keep doing the same thing that we've always done, we'll go down this path. And it's likely a declining path, right? There, there might be a church that says, hey, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to thrive. But most churches who are in need of innovation are going to say, well, if we keep doing what we're doing, it's a, it's a downward trickle. And so then the, the trick is to say, what is God's emerging future for mm. us? What is what is the new thing that might be possible here? Yeah. And again, this is not this clear like aha like silver bullet. It's a murky, foggy thing that just slowly starts to yeah. emerge as you do this work together. Yeah, yeah. And what I love about it is it centers the people. Like you're no matter what, you're starting with the center of the process about the needs and the cares and the concerns of the people that you serve. A, a mentor said, of mine says, the people that are entrusted to your care, um, which I think is just such meaningful work. Um, so let's talk about yeah. talking about it. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, a yeah, good idea. Because what I've found is that churches, they often haven't done the work of mission and vision. So they haven't articulated, this is who we are, this is where God is calling us to go. And so what happens is we often assume that we yeah. know. So we assume that we know and we don't talk about it. And that means everybody in the congregation is going to have a little bit of a different perspective or maybe a significantly different perspective of who we are yeah. and where we're going. And I think that's one of the main causes that we get stuck as churches is because we don't talk about it. And so we naturally have yeah. a pull in a million different directions just because we understand it differently because we haven't talked about it. And when you start talking about it, that's tough mm -hmm. because that might start to shift the way all of us think about why we exist and why we're doing this thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. So we have a process through Generation Spark, which is a mentoring program that we offer through the RCA. But at the end of the process, there's this one little module that's called Evaluation and Innovation. And in, in theory, that actually should happen first, right? That should happen at the very beginning of a program because what it does is you're evaluating where everybody is in in their opinion. So if you're taking a particular issue, for example, um, you know, we want to change the coffee, and we're not sure what your experience is with coffee. Do you drink coffee? Do you not drink coffee? Do you like tea? Um, what you do is you start by asking your people, and that I feel like is such a counterintuitive way to start because, for me, I, when I am told to do that, I'm like. No, I don't want everyone's opinion. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. But what that does is it gives you data. It gives you information to say, okay, here's what's going to happen if we cut the coffee completely. These three people are going to leave. We know that because on the survey that we did, they told us they were going to leave. It's hard to hear that, though. Totally. It's hard to do those surveys and get that feedback. Totally. But it's important to rip the Band-Aid off. Totally. Yeah. And, and so for, for leadership teams, as they're discerning and thinking about these vision and mission and reaching the community and, and living into the needs that people are expressing, um, it's important to see on, on paper what is actually going to happen. Um, and then to just share the information. That's the other hard piece, to say, here's what we learned. Here's what the survey said. And, and in that, you start to say, here's our steps towards discerning what we're going to do next. And that transparency can oftentimes save some of those relationships where it's like, I would leave if you did this, but because you shared a process with me and because I'll be able to be involved, I might be willing to just stick it out for a little bit. Um, so that could shift, yeah, that could shift the reality in and changes, of itself. It changes, yes, because it becomes much more personal. It's, it's again, it's people, people tailored. Um, I do wanna share like an example of when we did this. So at General Synod, we gathered a couple of people um, from across the, the Reformed Church, and we did a listening session, and, and we kind of first sent out a survey and said, tell us what your biggest challenges are, tell us what your, your biggest successes are. And then what we did is we correlated, we, we collated the data and, and said to the, the room, here's the three biggest challenges. The three biggest challenges were um, personal wellness, 
how do I take care of myself? How do I make sure I don't burn out? Leadership development. How do I train my leaders so that they are prepared for the, the landscape of church today? And then the third one was financial scenarios. We are very aware that our tithing is good right now, but we're, we're afraid that in a few months or a couple years that this is just going to go bad. Um, and we want to be thoughtful about creating some, some changes so that we're not, we're not just dependent upon an old way of being. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask you, my financial friend, like have you, you've encountered this narrative. Yeah, oh, quite a bit. And one of the things, and this goes right back to what you were saying. So you were talking about surveys and yeah. data, right? Yeah. So in the Cultivating Generous Congregations um, learning cohorts that we run alongside Lake Institute on Faith and Giving, they they ask churches and leaders to do some things that we get a lot of resistance to at first. Ooh, okay, okay. Okay. And this is that the pastor and at least one other trusted leader need to know the finances. Mm. They need to know not only how much is being given, but who's giving it. Yep. And a lot of pastors will will hold that away at arm's length. They'll even they'll even celebrate it, saying, We were taught never to do that. I I, I don't know who's giving. It allows me to do whatever. Yeah. And, and what we've found looking at the data, yeah. looking at best practices, looking at examples from the most successful nonprofits is that is a harmful practice mm-hmm. when we ignore yeah. the data and the numbers. And so we help to people reframe their theology around that, to reframe their own ability to be um, confidential mm-hmm. and to care for people and really start to view especially the practice of, of looking at numbers as more of a pastoral care opportunity yeah. than something that could cause you to be a, a lesser or mm. a, a, a worse pastor Yeah. in that regard. And so the point is, is that once we start looking at the data, it tells a story yes, and we can does. begin to plan. So we can say, oh, 50% of our budget comes from 90-year-old Betty and 92-year-old Stan. And we need to begin to plan for that because they will eventually pass away. And we, so you can start to see, okay, there are these realities that we can plan on now ahead of time rather than being surprised and scrambling and in crisis mode. And if we can start to talk about that with our younger people, with the next generation of givers, we have time to start building a new culture. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. I, you know, I'm sitting here like, oh, phew. Um, we recently switched to that practice and I got a, you know, I felt internally this conflict of, is this okay that I know the the practices of giving in our faith community, and just what you said, you do have to intentionally be careful, um, even with my spouse. My spouse does not want to know, and we're co-pastors. He does not want to know who's giving, but one of us needed to know, mm-hmm. and what I found is that it, you're exactly right. It helps us plan. It helps us determine what what more needs to come in if we want to do X, Y, and Z to live into kind of the faithfulness that we feel called. Um, and kind of the last piece is it's helped us get creative. So now a couple of our deacons are like, okay, we feel really excited about this. We know what we're, what we're expecting, but we want, to, we want to expand the budget. We want to try, are there grants that we can pursue? Is there some sort of revenue generating thing that we can start to try that we haven't done yet? Is there something we used to do that we could try again? Um, and that has been really life-giving in a way that I didn't think was going to be because I was afraid to know. Yes, it's surprising when you actually do the hard thing and, and yeah. take a look. In, in any of these innovative tools that we're talking about in ministry, when you yeah. when you enter into it, all of a sudden you realize that it's, it's energizing. And I, I know for me, when I started to assess the actual data of our church's giving, um, I was surprisingly um, filled with a deep sense of gratitude, seeing that um, people were invested and, and trusted and wanted this ministry to move forward. It just just to hold the faces, names, and and finances together, yeah. it, I was just welled with gratitude. Sure, there was a couple of areas where I'm like, we could work on this, this or that, but overall, it's energizing yeah. for ministry. So often we we're afraid to look. And it's like that way in personal finances too. When things feel a mess, I I don't even want to address it. Totally, yes. But once we dive in, sort things out, and come up with a plan, it's like, oh, the weight is lifted. Mm -hmm. I feel like I know the next step to take. Yeah, that reminds me of, so there's kind of two points that I just was thinking about when you're saying that. One is, um, so I was on the phone with a pastor, and we were talking about how do you enfold younger people into your faith community? Um, and he was like, we are a very in, 
intergenerational church. We have five generations of people in our church, um, which I was like, wow, that's wild. That's awesome. And he said, one of the commitments that we have is that we are always looking at what we're doing and asking, how can we bring younger people in this? How can we enfold more generations into this? And that, so th- one of the examples was he, they do a breakfast for, for 65 to 80 year olds and they do it once a month. And what they invited the young, the young high schoolers to do is he just said, hey, I'd love for you to go. I'd love for you to sit down and have conversations with some of our older members. I'll pay for your breakfast. We'll pay for your breakfast if, you're, if you are willing to do that. And what he said is the feedback has been so good that they're like, oh, you don't, you don't really have to even pay for us. We're good. Um, and I just thought that was really cool. Like that he said the, the reciprocity of what they received was this meaningful connection. That's the point, obviously. Yeah. And I just, but the, the skill is looking at what you're doing and just maybe not throwing it all away, but just tweaking it a little bit. And I get the sense from you and from personal experience that these intergenerational relationships are, are actually a key factor in innovation. I mean, is that what you're sensing? Totally. Yeah. I, th- I think it, the other thing this pastor said to me was, he said, we have so many generations and they, they will get talking, but they're missing each other. They, they, they talk over each other. They, they kind of think that they're saying the same thing and realize that they're not saying the same thing. And so I, I say this knowing that this is not easy work. When you have multiple generations in the room, your values are different. Um, the way in which you communicate is different. The way that you understand and, and receive information is even different. Like young kids can't read cursive. <laughs> you know, like that's a huge generational barrier. There's just like those little nuances that we just have to consider when we're thinking about innovation and evaluation. And that's why it's so important to start by listening to everyone, by asking questions first, because then you get the experience, the wisdom, and the insight from everyone so you know and can plan and so be thoughtful. I've got to admit this like nagging thing that's going on in my head right now. So okay. this is all right. Yeah. This is all like true to my experience. And when you start engaging people like this, especially in these innovative practices, like that's when anxiety starts to bubble up totally. in the community. And like for a pastor... It's exhausting, Mm -hmm. right? So how does well-being in your mind fit into this? I think there's two things. And and one of the times we need to talk about resilience a little bit. But Mm -hmm. um, there's a difference between being approached with anxiety and responding out of anxiety and being approached with anxiety and responding in a way that's differentiated. And so I don't think that this you can do this for every scenario. But I think it's so important to have some mental framework that when, when you can see and identify that someone is anxiety driven or that you yourself are feeling anxious, you have to have a practice kind of charted out. If you're feeling anxious, you, you, it's okay to name as the leader, hey, I'm feeling anxious. Can we talk about this uh, at a different time? Or to say, I just want you to know I'm feeling anxious. I'm just gonna put on a differentiated posture for me personally, that actually looks like I talk differently. I, I physically like roll my shoulders back so that I'm not sitting in an anxious position. I take a few deeper breaths and then I am very slow when I communicate. But I do that so that I am not affected or impacted by the other person. And that's just in that inner, interpersonal experience. You know, I think there's also daily practices. Um, there's also weekly practices. There's monthly practices that we can develop um, and, and so those are just really critical, but I, those specifically in those tense moments, I think as pastors and leaders, it's not up to us to fix the moment, to deflect from the moment, to disengage from the moment, unless we are so, so anxious that we can't have a really good conversation. Like, because yeah. your brain is literally going to be in the dumb mode. <laughs> like it's yeah. just not going to be in a good spot. Yep. Anxiety makes us stupid. Yeah. Yeah, and so to be able to, yeah, to stay differentiated, and you have to know your values to do that, right? right? You yeah, have to that's get really point. clear about your personal values in those moments. But I also really liked how you named there's there's an immediate 
um, thing we need to do for well-being, and then there's a the long term. So how am I going to show up in those really mm -hmm. tense moments as we talk about innovation? But then knowing that innovation, I mean, this is a long term yeah, thing. Yeah, right. Innovation is not quick usually. No. And right. so to, to identify, okay, we just did something really hard as a congregation. Let's, let's turn the burner down a little yeah. bit, right? Let's have a couple of months where we're just enjoying each other's yeah. company, yep. living into this new reality, letting the dust settle. And then you can like heat things back up a little bit. But if you just have the burner on high the whole time, it boils over and it becomes unsustainable for everybody. That's such a good point. I'm so glad you said that. For large communities, when you're doing this corporately, play is so important. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you of all people mm -hmm. said it, Billy, because you're an Enneagram 7. Is that I, correct? I am. And play is critical it's for a me. Big point. Yep. Yep. Anytime I feel trapped in the anxiety, it's yep. not good, right? So to have that opportunity to, yeah. Just have a church picnic in the middle of it yeah, or whatever right, it is for your right? community. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. Well, thank you. And I think this is the end of today's episode. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, smash the like button or yeah, the comment yeah, yeah, or whatever yeah. it is, right? So add, add you need more content from us. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. But we've loved getting to yeah. uh, converse in this way with you all. And if you have questions, throw them in the comment section and we'd love to add them to our series of videos. Yeah. And remember, this is about making aware awareness of resources. Mm -hmm. So whether it's grants, coaching, abilities to join learning cohorts, to, to do this work, hopefully you have a little more of a sense of what is available within the RCA. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.